The English band Lush would be known for their dense, guitar-centric sound with ethereal and dreamy vocals. They would be lumped in with the shoegaze and dream pop movements, and frequently drew comparisons to groups like Cocteau Twins, despite their own assurances that they sounded like no one. Despite Lush's sweet sound, their history was anything but. Today, let's talk about whatever happened to the band Lush. Lush would be led by guitarist and vocalist Mickey Bereni and Emma Anderson. Bereni would grow up in a suburb of London to a Hungarian father who was a freelance sports journalist. He had left his home country in the 50s as the Soviet tanks rolled in, and by 1964, he was on assignment in Japan as part of the Olympics. It was there he met Mickey's mother, a local, and they soon headed off to England and eloped against the wishes of her family. Bereni's mother would be a homemaker and part-time actress, appearing in the James Bond film You Only Live Twice. By the age of four, her parents would divorce, amongst a backdrop of infidelity on both their sides. A young Bereni would move in with her mother, who influenced her musical tastes early on, frequently playing groups like The Kinks, ABBA, Roxy Music, and Carly Simon. When Bereni was 11, her mother moved to Los Angeles, living with Cary Grant's stunt double and becoming an agent for the city's photographers. She would visit her mother during the holidays, but for the most part she lived with her father in London, along with her emotionally abusive Hungarian grandmother. Bereni would admit to Melody Maker that when she was a kid, she would go to bars with her father and help him pick up women. Her unorthodox childhood coupled with her emotionally abusive grandmother resulted in Bereni being lonely in most of her younger years and having a nervous breakdown at the age of 14, and soon enough, she regularly began smuggling bottles of vodka into the toilet stalls at her school. She would admit to interviewers she wasn't initially resentful of her parents, instead sticking up for them when she was a teen. But once she became an adult, that soon changed. By the time Bereni was 15, she was almost abducted, an experience that weighed heavily on her for quite a long time. By the time she was 14, she would meet her future bandmate Emma Anderson at a posh girls' school named Queen's College. Both girls were only children, and coupled with their unorthodox childhoods, they bonded. Bereni would recall to an interviewer the first time she met her future bandmate, saying, Emma arrived in my class on the same day as a vivacious, self-confident Californian girl who became immensely popular within 10 seconds. America was seen as super glamorous at the time. This left me free and unchallenged to bond with Emma over our both wearing the exact same Dolce's black and gold weave ballet pumps. Emma's father was a former member of the military turned writer and Arctic explorer who also ran a gentleman's club frequented by veterans. As a kid, Emma was shuttled between many schools and constantly fought with her parents. Her parents didn't really care about their daughter getting an education and pushed her to marry young and get together with someone who was well off. She would recall to Melody Maker, I was shunted around schools a lot, but I was brought up into a strange place, a gentleman's club. It was full of old boys, old majors coming into our flat for a free drink instead of going to a bar, and I'm the only child there so there's no kids to play with. It wasn't a bad childhood, just different. Since both girls couldn't relate to the snooty attitudes of their schoolmates, they soon put their focus on music, going to a lot of concerts, and working on a fanzine named Alphabet Soup, which Melody Maker referred to as Teenage Smut. The publication was better known for swear words and obscenities than much of anything else. The girls' early musical taste saw them gravitate towards groups like Duran Duran before getting more into goth. Eventually, this led the pair of wanting to learn to play music. While Bereni first learned bass, herself and Anderson would both eventually learn guitar, strumming along to Blondie and Roy Orbison records. It was following high school both girls went to different post-secondary schools and played in different bands in the early to mid-80s, while also still remaining close. They would join forces in their own band around 1986 or 1987, calling themselves the Baby Makers. They would eventually change their name to Lush, and the group's original lineup, with the exception of Anderson, would consist of Bereni schoolmates from Polytechnic of North London, including vocalist Mariel Barham, drummer and former punk rocker Chris Ackland, and bassist Steve Rippon. Rippon, who was five years older than the other members, didn't even know how to play bass when he first joined the group, so he had about six weeks to learn the instrument, since they had a gig booked in March of 87 at the Camden Falcon. Rippon would tell the publication Record Collector what his first time was like playing with the band, I went down to an audition at this place behind Holloway Road. They were possibly the worst group I've ever seen in my life. It was an absolute cacophony. The songs were really simple and had titles like Female Hybrid, Seesaw, He's a Bastard. I thought, well, I can play bass to this. Bereni, meanwhile, would paint a picture of the scene in Britain at the time, telling the Chicago Tribune, When we started, there had been a scene in Britain known as the Shambling Scene or Anorak Scene. 
It was bands that couldn't play very well, that could play about three chords and everything was a bit out of time and no one could sing. In a way it was like punk but without the energy. It was all rather sweet little ditties like a pop version of punk. We saw that and thought, we can do that, we're as good as that. But of course, the minute we stepped onto the London gig circuit, all these bands got absolutely slagged off and all these really professional bands started appearing. Then it suddenly became very necessary to play well. Both Bereni and Anderson would be the creative forces behind Lush, and it was early in the band's career Muriel would leave the group and join the band Pale Saints. Muriel didn't really seem to be a good fit with Anderson telling Select Magazine, she just wasn't interested. We'd organize all these gigs and she couldn't play them because her boyfriend was going away the next day or whatever. He came first, but she also wasn't comfortable playing guitar. However, the band would play one show with Muriel fronting the group, where they got a rave review by Melody Maker that soon attracted the attention of nearly a dozen record labels. But none of the labels signed the band because by their own admission, they were still a terrible live act. But Lush would get to redeem themselves. The absence of a vocalist resulted in the group putting out a wanted ad in the local classifieds and music magazines, but the auditioning process went horribly and the band were soon dealing with a lot of singers who had huge egos and wanted to make a full-time living off the band, and they didn't want to deal with any of it. Lush would admit to the Chicago Tribune they had one opera singer rehearse with the group, and they had another vocalist who was so claustrophobic to the point that the members of Lush had to find a bigger rehearsal space. Bereni would be pushed by her bandmates to step up to the microphone with Anderson, and it was before her first gig as frontwoman that she got drunk and sang out of tune. But they soon found their footing. Lush would finalize their lineup in October of 1988, and the band soon continued to play to college audiences and use borrowed equipment. Lush's sound with their revised lineup drew a lot of comparisons to Cocteau Twins, but Lush brushed off these assertions, claiming they sounded like no other groups. The early sound of the group put the vocals on the back burner, focusing more on guitars with the flame-haired Bereni telling the interviewer, we were kind of punk in one way. Our idea was to have extremely loud guitars, with much weaker vocals, and really the weaker vocals were due to nervousness. We'd always be going, turn them down, turn them down. Anderson would add telling Guitar Player Magazine, we used more distortion when we first played, mainly because we couldn't play a note. We'd hit the distortion pedal to cover our mistakes. Lush's early songs saw the band play three chords as fast as possible, but as they got more experience under their belt, they got more experimental with their music and started to play slower songs. When it came to the creative process, Lush was never a band that jammed and came up with songs that way. Instead, Anderson and Bereni would write separately from one another on 8-track recorders and use drum machines and bring their songs to the band. But their relationship soon grew tense as the band got further into their career with Bereni telling James Jam McMahon, I sometimes wrote lyrics for her songs, but Emma and I became polarized in so many ways that I eventually felt that any input I offered on her songs was unwelcome. And my songs were little of no interest to her, so she had no enthusiasm for investing any time or energy into embellishing them. But it's why producers we worked with were so key, because they were the only point of collaboration. By the end of 1988, Lush wrote a few original songs and had a few more gigs under their belt, but they had a long way to go before establishing themselves as an impressive live act. Bereni would tell the alternative press about their early gigs, we couldn't play, we were so awful. We once had a whole crowd walk out halfway during our first song. I didn't even know how we had the nerve to go up on stage again. We used to look at the floor so we didn't have to see the crowd. But by 1989 with a revised lineup, the group cut a demo tape and sent it off to 4AD Records with the label's co-founder Ivo Watts Russell checking the group out once again, and he eventually signed them, agreeing to finance some demos, much against the advice of his colleague Howard Gaw, who thought the band was terrible. Funny enough, Gaw would go on to become the group's manager after having a change of heart about them. In February of 1989, Lush released a six-song mini-album titled Scar, and the band's lyrical themes were mostly cynical despite being buried underneath a heavy layer of guitar effects. Scar earned Lush some praise from the press, with some pointing out that the band hadn't yet reached its full potential. It was at this point the band members were still attending school, with the exception of Anderson, who took a year off doing press work for other bands. Ackland would tell the Chicago Tribune what this time was like, recalling, For us, college was such an easy thing. Like seven or eight hours a week, doing maybe four essays, the lectures were lazy, the college was something to do when we weren't rehearsing. When we got our degrees, we just said, we'll give this band a year. Soon 4AD Records was interested and we got gigs. A year after its release, the Scar mini album sold about 15,000 copies. Despite the press attention, that didn't stop the band from attracting their fair share of haters. Lush would appear on the cover of a February 1990 issue of Melody Maker, where they told the interviewer, we are the most hated band in London. 
Jeff Tate of Rough Trade Records told us that because some people think we were made by the press. They can't wait to see us destroyed in print. The members of Lush were quite cynical of the British press and all the hype with Bereni telling the alternative press in 1990. The British press are a bit funny. They're really fickle, but everyone in the British press seems to know each other and, and all the other bands know the press. They're quite small-minded. We got a lot of reviews before we did anything. And by the band's own admission, it resulted in some people coming to the group's live shows not being impressed by what they saw. It wasn't just their music getting the attention of the press, as soon enough Lush became fodder for the gossip columns, who took note of their hard partying ways and Bereni's romantic escapades. In addition to that, the female half of the band soon garnered more interest from the press than the rhythm section, with Bereni telling B-sides, People do start ignoring the rest of the band, and to a point I can understand because me and Emma do write the songs, but we are a band, not just me and Emma with the two people messing about in the background. Lush would return in 1990 with their first EP, a four-track release titled Mad Love, which was produced by Cocteau Twins' Robin Guthrie, who was on the same label 4AD. The band wanted to work with Guthrie on Scar, but their schedules didn't line up at the time. Mad Love would earn the group much praise from the British press, and the album did reasonably well in the UK charts. It was the same year the band reportedly got an offer from the clothing brand The Gap to model for them, and famed photographer Annie Leibovitz saw a photo of the group and wanted to shoot them, but both offers fell through. Lush's members were becoming more weary of success and fame, not completely rejecting it, but wanting to make it on their own terms, with drummer Chris Acklin telling Melody Maker, I'd be quite happy to get onto the charts, but I'd want to do it like someone like the Buzzcocks or the Jam. The only reason those songs got into the charts was because they were really good and they weren't written to be commercial. It was this type of attitude that got the band labeled as being inaccessible and pretentious, and having an audience that was mostly made up of studious English kids, something they refuted as being utter rubbish. It was in October of 1990 that Lush would release their second EP titled Sweetness and Light, which found chart success in the UK and broke in America. The title track would peak at number 4 on the US alternative airplay charts, and it was in the summer of 1990 Lush played the Glastonbury Festival. It was the same year that the band also signed a deal with US label Reprise Records, who along with 4AD, would release a compilation record Gala in November of the same year. Gala consisted of the tracks from the Scar Mini LP, the EP's Mad Love and Sweetness and Light, and a few new tracks. To promote Gala, Lush would embark on a tour of Canada and America for the first time, and even opened several shows for Jane's Addiction. It was in 1990 the band started to draw a lot of comparisons to another British group, The Sundays, and basically any other bands that had female singers, something the members chalked up to lazy journalism, Side note guys, I've done a whole video on the career of the Sundays, the link is down below. Anderson would tell Melody Maker in 1990, I don't think of myself specifically as a woman in a group, but yeah, I sometimes look at other women in bands and get disappointed. There's hardly any women in bands writing. They sing and that's it. With Bereni adding in a separate interview with the Alternative Press, I think there should be a lot more bands where women don't feel compelled to show their bodies or use their bodies to promote a band. I think it should become more acceptable to do that. Lush would differ from their British counterparts in one major way. They and their label were determined to break through in America, and they toured extensively there. Lush would end up releasing their third EP Black Spring in 1991 and embark on a UK tour, but it was by the end of the year they would lose bassist Steve Rippon, who left over personal and creative reasons. The following year, 1992, was going to be a busy year for the band, who planned on releasing their first full-length studio album, in addition to touring extensively around the globe. It was these heavy commitments and being away from his girlfriend, as well as having minimal input in the creative process, that led him to leave the band. Rippon would retreat to Ireland to become a novel writer and spend more time with his girlfriend. His replacement would be Phil King, who once served as the editorial assistant for the New Musical Express, and he would come to the band through a recommendation by a friend. After the band's horrible ordeal of auditioning singers, they didn't want to go through the same process with a bassist. Lush would release their record Spooky in 1992, and the album was steeped in melancholy and dreamy harmonies and guitar effects and would once again be produced by Robin Guthrie. The band would be persuaded to ditch some of their acoustic drums in favor of Simmons' electronic drums, something Acklin would later come to regret. Bereni would tell the alternative press about the sound of the record saying, I think we're just sort of drawn to those sad sounds. I actually tried to write an up-tempo song and it still sounded miserable. That's what happens when you're brought up in 1980s damp dreary London 
With her adding, you can be so much more eloquent about stuff that pisses you off. Tracks like The Ballad Fantasy deals with the girls' teen years of when they had posters of groups like Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet on their wall, while Laura pays homage to folk artist Laura Nero. Despite peaking at number 7 on the UK charts, Spooky earned the band mixed reviews with Anderson telling Melody Maker, We got a lot of slag in with Spooky. People said, oh, it's more of the same, but what did people expect? Other critics would claim that it was void of anything resembling the group's live sound, while others in the press felt that Lush had softened their sound with Acklin telling the Chicago Tribune, We had a press tour in Europe and a lot of people said, You've mellowed out. You've lost your hard edge. Well, I think it's still fairly abrasive, but it's only natural that the more people play their instruments, the more they're developing as artists. Popular around the time of Spooky's release was the Riot Girl movement, something the girls in Lush had no affinity with, with Bereni telling Under the Radar, I didn't really get a chance because the main champions and cheerleaders of the UK scene instantly marked us out as the enemy. They slagged us off in the press. Wrong kind of girl, I guess. Soundscan would report that by 1994, Lush had sold about 89,000 copies of Spooky in America, while Gala, the compilation album, moved about 55,000 units. It was in the summer of 1992 that Lush joined the traveling tour known as Lollapalooza, alongside acts like Ice Cube, Pearl Jam, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. By the end of 1992, Lush got off the road with Bereni and Anderson retreating to their respective homes to write material for their follow-up album. The result was 1994 Split that was far more stripped down, easier to decipher lyrically, with even a lyric sheet being included in the release. But musical tastes had changed as grunge was popular, as was Britpop, and soon enough critics and the general public took an indifferent approach to Split. While many in the press harped on the fact that it took Lush two years to record their follow-up album, the band wasn't resting on their laurels, spending a good year touring and another year writing new material, while also dealing with a myriad of issues including finding a producer and problems with their management. Originally, Lush wanted Bob Mole to produce Split, but he only liked a few of the songs the band presented to him and was more interested in doing an EP. At one point, the band even thought about bringing John Paul Jones, but he wasn't interested. Bereni would tell an interview in 1993 how they finally settled on a producer recalling, so we just went through our record collections and wrote down every single name, and Mike Hedges, who worked with Echo and the Bunnymen, and Susie and the Banshees, The Cure, etc. was one of them. He's more into working with bands and getting a good performance, it worked out really well. Bereni would note that the biggest difference between Split and Spooky was that the band opted to use amps and microphones instead of recording everything through effects processors, telling Guitar Player Magazine, two approaches are completely opposite. Every single sound on Spooky had an effect on it. On Split, we wanted a live sound. That was partly because when we made Spooky, we weren't a particularly good live band. After Spooky, we went on tour for a whole year and actually got reasonably good at playing live. So many people said, you sound so different than you do on your record. It's so much more powerful. We thought it might be nice to record an album that actually sounds like us, not like how our producer decides we should sound. Split's lyrical content would tackle themes of Emma's childhood, and more general themes of sadness and betrayal, including the subject of Anderson's experiences with ill-fated relationships. But unlike bands like Hole or Babes for Toyland, which were much more confrontational or blunt with their lyrics, that wasn't Lush's style with Bereni telling Enemy in 1994. I don't feel comfortable making things as simplistic as that. It was during Split the band ran into a lot of problems with recording the album, their management, and a myriad of other things. Bereni would take a look back at the album in 2007, telling Under the Radar, most of the problems were external and circumstantial. Rockfield was fun for a while, but to be honest, we've been talked by Howard, our manager, into a residential setup and it didn't suit us. I got bored and homesick, missing the distractions and friends in London, and then Mike, our producer, insisted we go to rural France to mix in his own studio. The isolation just became depressing. All this coincided with the three main supports for the band, Howard, the manager, Ivo, the label head, and Tim Carr, our A&R at Warner's, going through their own personal issues, which left us feeling abandoned. By the time we were remixing with Alan Mulder, morale was low, although he was wonderful. When the album finally came out, I struggled to find the energy and self-belief to withstand the mostly negative reviews. To make matters worse, the band wasn't even in Britain when Split was released, as their label was convinced that their efforts would be better spent trying to make inroads in America. On top of that, the band released two singles on the same day from the album, with Hypocrite and Desire Lines, something New Musical Express stated was career suicide. Bereni would tell Enemy in 1996, the whole Split campaign for the band was a f***ing nightmare. Putting out two different singles on the same day was, with hindsight, a f***ing stupid idea. Yeah, the album just seemed to come out into a big void. We just didn't get on the telly or anything, so it was all over in Britain inside two weeks. Lush would also point the finger at their label and their management, who dropped the ball on marketing the record. 
Anderson would add, it was like being defeated before we even started. It was like, well, they probably won't get on the charts, so let's do this thing where it's almost like saying they don't care about the charts. This was decided for us so quickly, and the other thing was that everybody thought Lush were going to take off in America. But there was no logic, no tour with REM or any great campaign. And then when we didn't sell a million, it was, well, that didn't work. This tension led the band to break up for a short period of time in America while they were on tour in New Orleans. And soon enough, the tabloids were claiming that the band members were abusing hard drugs, something they vehemently denied. Despite making some inroads in America on alternative and college radio, Split would sell around 51,000 copies in the States, well below expectations. Soon enough, many in the press wrote the band off, unable to shake that shoegazing label, and in the eyes of many, they were has-beens. The band was also soon hearing rumblings that their label was about to drop them. Plans to release another UK single and tour Japan would be scrapped, and the focus soon shifted to working on the group's follow-up record. Bereni would admit to Select Magazine that she soon fell into a depression and started questioning her songwriting abilities. She would admit to James Jam McMahon, I think Split was the opposite of what the music press expected. They wanted a trajectory from sweetness and light for love and deluxe toward ever more polished shimmery pop songs and we gave them Hypocrite, Desire Lines, and When I Die. A fragile, downbeat, introverted album was about as out of step as you could get in 1994 when the vibe was all about being big and brash and having it large. Lush soon fired manager Howard Gaw, who initially told him that Split was going to be a massive success, only to turn around and chastise the band for not writing more commercial songs, with Anderson telling Record Collector, he let us down on a very personal level, with Bereni adding, we put so much into Split, we really did, and then for someone to tell you it's not good enough and saying you should write songs like Elastica or The Cranberries is f***ing infuriating. Bereni would go into more detail telling the alternative press, he would come over here and spend a week in LA out of his mind getting pissed with Elastica or something never even dealing with the label, and then come back and tell us that we were on the verge of being dropped because nobody at the label liked us, when it was him they didn't like. Firing Goss seemed to change the band's attitude as they soon realized they still had fans all over the globe, and they also still had a record label deal and were still functioning as a band. The poor reaction to Split resulted in Lush wanting to not be as vulnerable with their lyrics on their follow-up record and soften their sound to be more poppy. Lush would return in 1996 with their follow-up album Love Life, which for the group was a do-or-die record. The New York Times would write about the band in their 1996 piece, The English group Lush has a problem. The pop clock is running out on them. The band for which its record company has long had big expectations has never really moved into the mainstream. Love Life would ditch the band's shoegazing and dream pop sound, opting to go more in line with Britpop than anything resembling the band's past. The band would brush aside any assertions that they changed their sound to be more commercial. Love Life's first single titled Single Girl would give the band their highest charting single of their career, peaking at number 21 on the UK charts, and their follow-up Lady Killers would peak at number 22. Meanwhile in the States, Lady Killers garnered a good amount of attention on college and alternative radio as well as MTV, the most they had gotten in their career stateside. Despite the glowing press coverage with some hailing Love Life as one of the best pop records of the year, the band deeply resented some of the press coverage that wrote off their past efforts with Bereni telling the LA Times, the album's more satisfied, more confrontational and confident. A lot of people think this album's about one guy and it's not. The song Lady Killers came from three specific incidents that happened in one week, like snapshots, and Chow was an imaginary situation. I actually used Nancy Sinatra and Lee Hazelwood's duet Jackson as a starting point for that. They bicker all through the song and I thought, two people arguing, I can do that. Pulp's Jarvis Cocker would guest star on the track. While Love Life showed signs of promise, it failed to raise the band's profile. The band's goal of breaking America felt like something that was just out of their reach despite the album reaching the upper echelons of the Billboard charts. Bereni would reflect back on the exhaustion of chasing the goal, telling James Jam McMahon, I just found you could never do enough to satisfy the itch that you were so close to breaking America. So the US record company and every manager I've ever worked with became obsessed with this goal. Every spare minute of the day was packed with radio station interviews, sessions, post sound check meet and greets, pre-gig dinners with local reps, and post-gig late night record store signing sessions. And every event demanded high octane, this is so much fun you guys, always on enthusiasm. It was often very enjoyable, but it took its toll. It was following a tough American tour to support Love Life that the band's drummer Chris Ackland took his own life at his parents' house in October of 96. Ackland was staying with his parents at the time, contemplating his next career move, and was even considering not touring with the band through Europe. A spokesman for the band would tell the press at the time, Chris had been depressed recently, but we don't know what reason there was for it. The US tour had not gone as well as they expected it to. They had been very busy with the record as well. I think it may have taken its toll. They were all very tired, but we never expected this. 
Six months prior to his death, Ackland would speak to Select Magazine, revealing that he and I quote, went through a phase of feeling a bit useless, saying, I wasn't really doing anything with my life. I was waiting for someone else to do it for me. After a while, you begin to feel a bit of a fake. And it ties you to London. Really, I'd like to make loads of cash and buy a country house. The Guardian newspaper would write an article in 1997 about Ackland's set of circumstances saying he'd split up with his girlfriend, he was living in a friend's back room, and despite relentless promotion, Lush's third album failed to break the group in America. At 30, Ackland was still on a basic wage of 150 pounds a week, a figure that hadn't changed in six years. Chris visited me in Dublin last summer, recalled Steve Rippon, the band's original bassist. He wasn't his chirpy self. He was feeling down for lots of reasons, but the money situation certainly didn't help. It wasn't anyone else's fault, just the way the music business works. He'd been in Lush for eight years, it was his job, but he couldn't even afford somewhere proper to live. It should be noted that Bereni wrote a letter to The Guardian disputing the claims about his dire financial situation with her writing in an open letter. It was true that Chris was on a £150 per week salary, but this sum also applied to the other three members of the band. There are several artistic advantages in signing to an independent label, but hefty million pound record company advances are not one of them. For this reason, a publishing deal was of significant importance to us. Though Emma and I as the band's songwriters were the ones to benefit contractually from this arrangement, we have always handed a percentage of our advances to Chris and Phil. The £150 per week basic wage you ascribed to Chris was just that, a basic wage, which was considerably up by publishing monies. It was following Ackland's death that the band cancelled their upcoming European tour and went through a period of inactivity before announcing their split in 1998. The band was devastated with the loss and didn't think they could continue on. The surviving members continued to work in the music industry, either playing in other bands, working for music magazines or talent agencies. As for their old bassist Steve Rippon, he was now working an IT job in Ireland. But had Chris not taken his life, it's possible that Lush would have still imploded with Bereni telling Under the Radar in 2007. Emma called a meeting with me and Phil. Chris was up at his parents' house in the Lake District. She wanted to leave the band. She felt the pressure to become successful in the US was swamping everything. Emma and I were not getting along well either. I'd venture to say that our relationship was always a bit fragile, but I desperately wanted the band to stay together and coerced her into giving Lush one more shot. A few days later, Chris was dead. We were falling apart as it was, and that was a killer blow. If Chris had been around, I might have had the strength to keep Emma happy and convince her to stay in Lush. If Emma hadn't already lost faith in Lush, maybe she would have been able to convince me that we would carry on even without Chris. Lush would reunite in 2015 and 2016 for some tour dates in Europe and America with Ackland's old friend Justin Welch of Elastica on drums. Lush would release a new EP in 2016 titled Blindspot, harking back to their old shoegaze sound. But by the end of the year, the band called it quits as Bereni would later reveal that old tensions resurfaced. It was in 2022 that Bereni would release her biography titled Fingers Crossed, How Music Saved Me From Success, which chronicled her life and career. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.